Thank you very much for joining us on PM Express. Tonight, we are going to talk to a man who surprised a lot of people. I bet he himself wasn't surprised, but many watching on, watching the NDC National Delegates Congress and its outcome, he possibly was the biggest surprise of the day. And he's a man who is known for being one of the most witty politicians you can find. He was the propaganda secretary once of the party, and then he really made his name for himself by leading the very famous Setting the Record Straight Forum, which really gave the MPP a good run for its money. He went to Parliament, and then for some reason, we lost touch with him for a while, only to show up on the ballot on Delegates Day, when the delegate decided for who really becomes the General Secretary of the NDC. He emerged victorious and it wasn't a close fight. He really led the field, took a commanding lead and never looked back. He was the first person we all saw emerging victorious on the night and everybody was wondering what in God's name was happening. I'm delighted to say that Fifi Fiavikwiti is my guest on PM Express tonight, just coming off the back of that tremendous victory at the NDC National Delegates Conference. Fifi, thank you very much for joining us. On thank you very much, Ivan. Happy to be here. And congratulations are in order. Thank you so much. When I say we're surprised, you understand why many would have been surprised, would you? I can, I can understand, I can understand. <laughs> but you weren't surprised. Yeah, but Ivan, let me begin first by uh, thanking God for, for, for this uh, beautiful victory and also thanking uh, uh, the wonderful delegates who reposed that trust in me and of course the teaming supporters of the party. Uh, for me, that was the most humbling, uh, humbling experience. Uh, asking them whether I'm surprised, to be honest with you, no, I'm not surprised. Okay. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, even the truth is that I don't, I don't undertake a journey uh, without having uh, taken a very deep introspection and weighing my, 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 my chances. Uh, even before I started this journey of running for the general secretary position, truth, I had already commissioned what I call a very scientific survey. So I had a clear idea of what my chances are even before beginning. So I, one of the things I've said about politicians is I can understand why uh, some people can be so delusional as to, for example, undertake a journey without even knowing what their chances are. Okay. I can appreciate if you go in a fight and you lose very closely. But the situation where you actually invest everything you got, resources, energy, everything you got, and actually only to discover that you really had no chance at all. For me, it's an unforgivable sin, and politically, I never will be guilty of that. So there's no way I would have gone into this race except knowing that I had a very, very good chance of winning. So there was research that backed this. So you, the, the outcome of the research decide, convinced you to join? Yes. Race. Because, you know, even the truth is that um, I was competing with two people who, uh, I would say, clearly have had uh, almost four years to work in the system. Uh, the Deputy General Secretary in charge of operations, uh, Dr. Peter Otokuno, had been the, the in charge for four years and of course built relationships, work with the party structures. Clearly, when you have a four-year relationship with any group of people, you naturally have a certain big advantage. I was working, I was contending also with Evis and Friankra, my own brother and friend, for a very long time, who was a director of election. Clearly built a lot of networks and relationships as well. So if I come in now, and of course I've been out of the party structure, I mean since 2009, when I became deputy minister for finance. So even though I was still a party person, you wouldn't call in directly in touch with, for example, regional, regional chairman, regional executives, constituency executives, branch executives. I was not directly doing that. Of course, I was still a party person. So if I'm going to go into a journey, I needed to first be sure what the chances are. And I did my, my uh, very quiet scientific survey, which proved to me that even without any campaigning, I had a fighting chance. But so that you made a very that's important the point there. Mm -hmm. let, let me just expand on. Yeah. Even without campaigning, yeah. you were convinced that. What was it that gave you that that confidence? Of course, the research told yeah. you you can do that. Yeah. But what was it that made a difference? I would say that 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 was the beginning of it. Because as I said, I always think that um, it's important not to simply believe your own hype. Uh, and I think that really has been the fatal flaw for not just many politicians, but many people in general. You need not to believe your own hype. So you need to have some evaluation in order to know exactly what are the chances. So I did that. And that told me that even though I had been 
not directly involved in what you call the party issues for quite a number of years now, even though I was still pretty much a, a party man and all, uh, my chances still were very good. Why? And I need why, why was that? I'm trying to narrow down okay. to, the, okay. to the elements, right. the characteristics okay. that would okay. still give you an advantage, although right. you've not been All right. at the I, center of things yeah, for a while. I, th I, think it's, I think it boils down to what I would call track record. Okay. Track record. I think a lot of people uh, still pretty much remember setting a record straight. Basically, they feel this is somebody who had paid a price for this party, mm. uh, who not only helped to secure power uh, the last time we took MPP out of power, also felt that this was somebody who went through the most grueling vetting in the history of our party, simply because of the job I had done for the party in terms of winning that, that, that victory. Uh, I think they also feel that they have an individual who uh, is difficult to compromise. And I think this party wanted uh, somebody like that, uh, uh, somebody that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you can go and sleep. Clearly, this, sub this person clearly cannot be compromised. This is somebody who will fight for this party and if need be die for this party. So I think these are already attributes that people were looking for. But of course, if you are fighting, you definitely also have to weigh some of the, 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 the issues, some of the disadvantages that I was coming with. And one of them, of course, is the fact that uh, I was not in the field for quite a bit and I was dealing with opponent. And also, there a certain disadvantage also because I was uh, taking over from um, Johnson Atiyah Nketiah, who after 70 years had really turned this into an institution. Yeah. And some way, somewhere over the 17 years, um, there's a certain unspoken belief that you needed, for example, to be extremely fluent in three before you can become a general secretary. You didn't have that, did you? Which never had been the case in the NDC in particular, which was quite, for me, it was like, a, what, I mean, what is going on? Because the NDC has had three general secretaries before I see in uh, Alaji Huduyaya, who actually never spoke any two at all, and Dr. Jose Aye, who never spoke any two at all, and Bid Zidin, who acted as general secretary until we went to Congress in, 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 in 2005, who never spoke any two at all. So, I couldn't understand how suddenly it has now become a norm that you needed to speak to you before you become general secretary. So clearly my opponents were using that, oh, oh, the guy doesn't speak any tree. In fact, the media, the guy doesn't speak any local language. Which I find funny, because, ah, what do you mean? I speak actually my, my local language, I speak very, very well. He said, no, 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 it's not good enough, you have to speak tree. Anyway, long and short. Your, your English is too flow and they couldn't imagine you speaking any right. local language. I know, right. I know, right. <laughs> so that clearly was one uh, Herculean obstacle that we needed to, 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 to deal with. So we, we use the opportunity to be able to, first of all, try to disabuse the minds of people. Uh, that even MPP, that is known to be an Akan party, has had a brilliant chairman, uh, who was Jacob H. who is yeah. a gun man, who incidentally does not speak gun at all, and also never spoke cheap, but he was still a great chairman even for MPP. So a party like NDC that is much more known to multicultural, bringing together everybody, you can actually be making a case that the only way you can become a general secretary is to speak one particular language. So we try to disabuse the minds of people and say, I was communication, I was in charge of communication for the NDC. I spoke English for the most part, and we still want power. So for you to say that now a general secretary, when I'm not in charge of communication, I need to speak three before I can become a general secretary, I think was not, was not a very good thing my opponents were standing on. So I think we were able to work on that and convince the delegate that no, they did not need to think of that as a major, major requirement. You just made a, a point secretary. there that emphasizes how important the student KTS dominance mm -hmm. in that space mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. I wonder, mm -hmm. before you decided, of course you had your research, yeah. but before you decided to actually mm -hmm. pick, up, pick up forms, mm -hmm. did you know that he was not going to contest that position again? At what point did you have the conversation with him? Okay. Would you have done it if he was still running? Okay, all right. Uh, in truth, um, I, I had actually publicly stated, I had publicly stated that um, if Asiru was minded to continue as general secretary, I was not going to run. Okay. In fact, the reason why my um, announcement delayed was also because I wanted to be respectful of that position. Mm. Uh, if you recall, my other two uh, contenders also had said something similar, yes. but they basically gave up very quickly and then started actually campaigning. Yeah. But I wanted to keep my word. So I waited and waited and waited until when finally uh, Asilu came to announce that he was not going to. So you wanted to be absolutely day. setting he's moved on to yeah. the other position. Yeah. For me, I look at it, no, it's not, for me, it's, it's never been like a personal project. I just feel we, we needed to make sure that uh, we, we, we had a good replacement for the general secretary if he's not ready. Mm. 
if he's not ready to go again. Uh, so if he was ready, my feeling was that he's done a good job. We can always help. Did you speak to him? Help. Did you seek his blessing, so to speak? Uh, let's say that we we spoke to him for my, I didn't want his, it. Didn't, I didn't want it to appear as if I was stampeding him, pushing him to make a decision. So I was respectful of that. But somehow we found informal ways of communicating. Mm -hmm. And when it was that he was preparing to finally uh, announce that he was not running again, I mean clearly. Uh, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got information in time okay. in order for, because of course he also knew that I was quite respectful of him and I think he was very grateful for that. It's always good to have people who, who respect your position and therefore do not act as if uh, uh, whether or not you make a decision, they are ready to do what they want to do. And I think he was quite, quite ready. So once he declared that he's not longer interested in the, in the mm -hmm. general secretary position mm -hmm. and declared his intention to run for the chairmanship, did you at any point speak to him at all? Yeah, we spoke. You spoke to him? Yeah, we spoke. Did we spoke. you say... I need your blessing, and what did he tell you? Because the, the view out there was that, uh -huh. obviously he's working with Tokono as a deputy, uh -huh. Uh -huh. he would possibly then, yeah. normally, yeah. And, uh, you know, would support Otokono oh, okay. and, not, okay. and not you. Did you, did you get his blessing? Uh, no, I, don't, I didn't look at it in terms of uh, seeking your blessing, no. I didn't look at it that way at all. But let's say it this way, he and I have had a wonderful relationship for all the years that we've been together. In fact, I've actually been almost like his number one fan, and he always knew that very respectful of his view, very respectful of his opinion. Uh, naturally, in this party, I've always loved people who are very, um, first of all, people who are filled with courage. People who clearly, uh, like myself, are really trustworthy. I love people like that. And of course, I like him also because he's got the capacity to be very forthright and also the gift of the gab. He can think on his feet and be able to, to as it were, uh, maneuver out on any situation. And so it's very great. So that, and of course, he's got something that I don't have. He's got a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. and, I, yeah. and, I, and I love to have a good laugh. So that's, yeah, I mean, I'm always the first to call him when I hear him. Yeah. I'm always the first to call him whenever he does his thing and kills it with the humor. I come and say, wow, today you just killed all of our game with this and that. So it's been always a very healthy, beautiful, beautiful relationship. Even in cabinet, even in cabinet. He and I have had instances where we took a position together against the whole cabinet. So we've had those very, uh, shall I call it, very aligned, aligned position for the most part. So I wouldn't say call it a blessing, but I would say it was an informal, informal blessing. Mm. Because sometimes you know what, uh, if you are, it's just like when I was National Propaganda Secretary, and uh, which is now the National Communication Officer, when I was exiting that position, I clearly have a clear idea who I think would have been a very, very worthy successor. I knew. Okay. I mean, when you've been in a position for a while, you do know. Uh, and to be honest with you, it's not so much I want to downplay uh, my two contenders, so Tokuno and Alves. But I think deep down in Otibu's heart, of the three, he knew who actually had a pedigree to be able to step in there and get a job done. There's something you said you picked up mm -hmm. why the delegates mm -hmm. gave you the nod. Okay. And you picked up in your research that convinced you mm -hmm. to run. Like the delegates were convinced that they wanted somebody at the helm, at the general secretary, mm -hmm. who was the chief executive mm -hmm. of the party, who can be compromised. Mm -hmm. Was that because of all that we know now mm -hmm. happened in 2020? In fact, your party's own research in the Shanti region, mm -hmm. commissioned by the Council of Elders yeah. there, found mm -hmm. that to be an issue. Okay. In the lead up to this Congress, mm -hmm. again, it was an issue. Mm -hmm. The suspicion and the belief mm -hmm. that a certain category of mm -hmm. people who led the party then mm -hmm. were not above board. Okay. They didn't show integrity okay. enough. Um, when the delegates told you that, okay. Was it coming from a setting reality that they've had to confront okay. over the last four years okay. as far as party leadership that they wanted to correct by putting you up? Okay. I can, I can, I can say so much about others, but I, I, I do think that in this party, uh, delegates and also party supporters have a clear idea uh, who are the people that can be trusted 100%. It doesn't mean others cannot be trusted. But I think they have a fair idea who can be trusted 100%. And so, so instead of just saying that it's a question of dark versus light, or it's a question of good versus bad, let me just say it this way, that it might be an issue of good versus very good and versus excellent. Mm. So in that category, I think they do know that some of us are very much on top of that bill when it comes to 
capacity to remain without, uh, without any manipulation and fight for what we know to be the truth, fight for what is good for the party and also what is good for our country. So I, I, that, that, that's all I can say. I'm not, I'm not yet in a, having been outside of what you call the direct things that are happening, I'm not in a position to make too many comments as to what the situation has been in what you mentioned, the report in Ashanti and so on. I'm sure moving into the position now, we'll be able to, as it were, take time and go through all that in order to have an idea. Because remember, in this game of politics, there are also situations where individuals for their own agenda can sometimes also, uh, should I call it, uh, uh, have biases. Have biases. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you understand, for example, uh, when my good my good friend uh, Inu Safusini on your channel yeah. uh, was as it were underrating my 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 chances in this election. Uh, I mean, let, let, let's be—he's my very good brother and friend. But he was clearly exhibiting his bias. That's what, that's all it was. It was nothing nothing uh, uh, in the middle or nothing uh, impartial. He clearly had a candidate and was pushing for that candidate and creating the impression that some of us didn't have a chance. But uh, that's fine. In this game, it, it, it's, it's allowed. It's allowed. What would you say yeah. <coughs> among all? the reasons mm -hmm. that the delegates give you. What yeah. would you say was the one most important pivotal reason that made you stand tall in the delegates' mind? Uh, I, think, I think it's difficult to just isolate one. I think it's a combination of things. I think it's a combination of things. Uh, let, me, let, me just, let me just mention them. Um, in the first place, I was able to let delegates appreciate that term. One of the biggest problems we had as a party was our inability to call it result early. And that has been historical. It happened to us in 2004. We simply were not able to call it our result very early. And remember, Jacob H. in 2004 went to the castle and he literally declared the people had won power, even before the Electoral Commission did so. 2016, we had the same problem. Effectively, like a whole coalition center, I mean, crashing on the night of election. And that also did not really stand as well. I'm not saying that's why we lost, but that clearly was a major problem because at least you must have a clear idea where you stand. Mm. In 2020, Truth be told, that's exactly what happened again. Now, so there is a clear history of this party having had issues as far as result coalition was concerned. Now, I was able to let the delegate appreciate that the last two times this party collated result very early in order to, for example, stop any attempt by our opponent from taking the power from us it was in 2008, first round and second round, and 2012. Evans, you remember, mm -hmm. because I was with you in the strong room in yes, 2008, yes. I mean, you were there. Yes. The main reason why we managed to stop anything that MPP wanted to do in that 2000 was because we had our result very early. Yeah. But the second night, we had our result, both in the first round and the second round. And the one who was in charge of that process, even though I was then the communication officer or national propaganda secretary, the person who took charge of that coalition was myself. Mm -hmm. And we had a coalition center uh, at, at Kanda. We were able to do a great job at that. Uh, in 2012, I was then deputy finance minister, but still, and actually running for parliament for the first time. So that night of election, I went, went my seat uh, in, in Ketu South and drove back to Accra by latest, by I think uh, 1 a.m. I was back in town, st headed straight to the coalition center, headed again the coalition of our party result, and we were able to get our result in time. And remember, uh, the late uh, Sir John, who was then the general secretary, kept boasting about how MPP guys should wear their white and go to church for celebration. We stopped all that because we were able to show through early coalition results that that had not, no substance, we had won power. So I've had a track record of showing that we can stop this problem of not being the coalition mm. result. And I give them assurance that as general secretary, they can be sure that this problem is a thing of the past, not under my watch, it's not happening. That was important to them. I also was able to clearly let the delegate know that I've got ideas, ideas that uh, when implemented, will be able to, as it were, create what I call a much fair uh, situation that can empower a lot of them at the, at the, at the, at the grassroots level. Uh, I believe there are, there, are, there are what you call synergies in both party and government that if properly, if properly harmonized, will be able to, as it were, help a lot of our people in the, in, the, in the constituencies. And that's an issue that was quite important to them as well. I was able to show clearly that we can do that. The details, I may not, I may not be mm. able to disclose now. Mm. I was also able to let them know that the campaign for 20, 2024 is largely going to be a campaign on the economy. Because as you know what's happening in Ghana now, it's all about the economy. Now, if you have a general secretary who actually is coming from that subject area, a former deputy finance minister, a man who clearly is prolific when it comes to discussing issues of the economy, a man who has got the facts, has got the figures, and of course has got the fire to back the facts and figures. That's a beautiful opportunity. 
And I told them clearly that I mean, our opponents, like Baumi and so on, clearly are not looking forward to having a general secretary who can be that prolific and who can set the record straight on the economy, marshal all the key powers that we have, both in parliament and outside of parliament, together with the party, in order for us to do a brilliant job at dealing with the MPP on the matter of economy, which will be the subject, the central theme of the campaign. I mean, that's a beautiful opportunity to have. Of course, the final thing I also told them was that as a party, a party that's known to be, should I call it, a Congress that brings together, I mean, every all the forces of our country, we need to be looking also at the, the very important issue of regional balance. That issue of regional balance, as far as the leadership of our party, has to be addressed. And if you look at the party leadership now, there's clearly, um, should I call it, in terms of the substantive position, you see, um, I mean, the World Bank of the Party Voter Region clearly missing. And of the people, the three people who are contending, there's one who is working with a 100% son from that region. So I would say these are four important pillars that I was able to lay out every, every constituency. I spoke heart to heart with them, listened to their concerns, and told them why I, pre I represented the best deal as far as the party is concerned, mm. occupying that key position in order to enhance our chances for 2024. Obviously, the delegates believed it. When we return from this quick break, I'm going to zero in on the last point he put before the delegates, something I had highlighted in our analysis of him, which is his origins from the Volta region. That had been an issue for many people in the party before this election, that you can have a party that drew its origin, drew its life, its spirit, its soul from the Volta region when it comes to the voting and the outcome of national elections and not have one person from there in the executives. I'll ask him how significant that is for the party going forward and how the voter region might play a role in the 2024 elections and what he brings to the ticket, to the ticket, whoever emerges a flag bearer in, in helping the party guide the base, the base in, a, in the voter region to, to vote and come and vote. Considering what the MPP had done, also electing somebody as a general secretary from its stronghold in the Shanti region, how important would that dynamic be? in 2024. And then the subject of economics is what he's raised. It's going to be the major issue for 2024. I'll, I'll pick his thoughts on uh, what he brings to the table. Are we going to see a return to the setting the record straight uh, from him on the economy? Uh, we'll talk about all that, plus the chances of the NDC going into the 2024 elections with him. And then how does he work to help unite the party? This has been very acrimonious leading into this uh, Delegates Congress. Uh, they, at the top, we had two giants who were fighting. The party may be fractured. They have to unite before they can look forward. What is his role in that? Stay with me. And thanks for staying with us. My guest is still the newly elected General Secretary of the NDC, Fifi Kwete. Mr. Kwete, so let's zone in on your roots. Okay. The NDC is known, known to be a party that draws its soul from the Volta region. Mm -hmm. It's the, the place that gives you the most votes. Mm -hmm. It is your World Bank. Mm -hmm. But of late, in the last two um, elections, when it comes to the party's internal national elections, mm -hmm. there's been a concern that the party was gradually not rewarding that loyalty mm -hmm. with the people that mm -hmm. the, you elect okay. in your executives. Mm -hmm. Don't take my word for it. Mm -hmm. One of your own, uh, I need to dissolve mm -hmm. the last time he lost, and mm -hmm. he wasn't the only person who lost on the water region, mm -hmm. publicly stated mm -hmm. that the party should be very careful, mm -hmm. uh, that they, they should be careful not mm -hmm. to take the water region for granted. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned that in your campaigning, mm -hmm. you mentioned that to the delegates. Mm -hmm. They voted for you, obviously, because they believed that mm -hmm. you were right. Mm -hmm. How important will this be? Now you've been elected, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So people then will be expecting you to deliver the voter mm -hmm. region. Mm -hmm. We've been analyzing the data. Yeah. In, anytime you fall from 19 to mm -hmm. the 80s, mm -hmm. in terms of percentage mm -hmm. sure. votes in the vote, you mm -hmm. lose the national elections. Okay. So you need at least to, mm -hmm. to aim to get 95% mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. 10 out mm -hmm. in the voter region sure. to win. Anytime you've done that, you won the elections. Yeah. How important will this be mm -hmm. in the eventual outcome because you're there now? Okay. All right, I think that's a very good question. Uh, firstly, let's, let's clarify it. Uh, in terms of voter region, uh, voter region has clearly been, um, uh, shall I call it, uh, the bastion of the NDC. And that, 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 that's normal. In every, in every uh, political um, calculation, you always have places where you can, you can believe there's going to be your biggest, your biggest support base, even in America, even in England. 
in the advanced democracies, you have clear strongholds that you just know is always going to be red or it's always going to be blue. The same in Ghana. So it is, it is what it is. Um, voter region is not simply about the geographical voter region. Voter region also have what you call huge, 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 huge. So I call it the ambassadors of the voter region. Mm. You find them in Greater Accra, huge. So if, if you go to the voter diaspora, yes, absolutely. If you go to Greater yeah, Accra, if you go to Greater Accra, massive numbers. You go to Eastern region, huge numbers. Ashanti, huge numbers. Bronga half or the three Bronga, the three three regions in original Bronga half in the northern part of Ghana, the same. So Western, Central, Western North. So you see a huge, 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 huge congregation of them in everywhere you go. So it's a much, much bigger than simply just one region. So that is something that every political party needs to be able to, if you have such a rich bed of people who clearly have a certain natural support for you, just as for example, if you go to America, New York will always be a bastion for the Democratic Party. Uh, LA, Los Angeles will always, California will always be for, for, for I mean, for the, for, 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 for the Democrats and so on. The same way it is, I mean, in Ghana. So the voter region thing clearly is an important consideration. Um, what happened in recent in recent times yeah has been an issue of concern so a political party must be smart to make sure you don't have a repetition of that 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 problem will voter be able to rally i believe voter definitely will rally because will they rally different. because fifi is there you know like, let's say it this way voter has traditionally uh, uh uh stood for the party but no matter how great you've been a time comes when you start feeling as though you are being taken for granted, and no one would like to be taken for granted. Uh, is that feeling I would let, real or perceived? I need to clarify that. Is that perceived or real? You know it better, so tell us. It's a combination of both. Okay. There's some perception that the that, that, uh, voter has been neglected, uh, but at a certain level, perception gets into reality when people start feeling that this is the case actually with us. And of course, when you look at the permutation as far as the leadership of the, of the party was concerned, voter felt that this is not right. This is not right. Especially when you look at what's happening uh, in the MPP, when you see, for example, that key key executives of the party MPP are coming from the stronghold of the MPP Ashanti region, and voter looks at the top of the ticket, he sees nothing. You understand? So it's, it's, a, it's a genuine concern. So it's not just perception; it also become a reality. So I believe I believe the region clearly will be will be very 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 willing to want to do everything it can for us to get power. Not simply because it is about the voter region, but because voter want NDC to come back to power. That's always number one. You, and voters have always shown that, through thick and thin, that no matter what happens, you want to fight for the party. Because as a party, it's just like a football team. This is your team. You, it's almost like family. It's almost religion. You always want to wa work hard for it. I believe there'll be even much greater work that voter will do. Because this time again, it's like this is an opportunity for us to do whatever we can to make sure that our son, who is now the general secretary of the party, is able to at least see victory. So it's a collective thing. And voter showed it through even there. You saw the, you saw the numbers that came from the voter region as far as the general secretary position. Was. And you can see it was massive. That tells you the region is ready. He's ready to want to do extra work. Extra work that will be able to deliver power. Not just work within the region, but also with the diaspora. And that it becomes important in terms of helping the party. I believe we'll be able to claw back the seats that we lost. It will be to also work on our numbers, not just in terms of uh, getting good numbers, but also getting good, a higher turnout. I believe we can achieve that. So you're, to you're talking about um, uh, um, the railways minister's uh, constituency in question, yeah. uh, John Peter Mewu. Yeah, um, actually that's where I was born myself, Hohoi. So that's basically like my own, uh, should I call it a natal, natal constituency. I was born there. So we're going to make sure, and I mean, who knows us, we're going to make sure we take our seat back. No, we've, that, we've, we've, loaned, we've loaned it to him for four years, and that's four years too long. So we take our seat back from him. So obviously you have your work cut. This is going to be one of your primary objectives, Abs to, to deliver that seat absolutely. and also the voter region massive numbers absolutely. for the NDC. Absolutely. Having said that, though, mm -hmm. in your campaigning, was there a point where the key makers in the party came, to, came around to agree that let's help make Fifi Kwete get this nod because they recognize that Volta needs that to galvanize the base. Was, was there a, a setting agreement at, at that level? I, I wouldn't say I sat with any kinmakers and, uh, and there was a decision made that we wanted to make sure you win. Okay. You know, when it comes to this business, you can never be too sure. Uh, you can never, you can have different people having different preferences, isn't it? Somebody likes A, somebody likes B, somebody likes C. You know, so I think, 
I would just say that um, as far as I'm concerned, I had uh, what I'm calling an army of uh, invisible, invisible soldiers that I don't know about. I go to constituencies and I'm told, oh God, before you arrive, this former MP had called, this former minister had called, this former MC had called, or this man actually called and said, you are the one, you are the one that they should go for. I mean, these are people that I hadn't spoken with, I hadn't even, uh, you couldn't call everybody and ask for everybody blessing. And these, and these are mighty, mighty, mighty people who were, who were working, I mean, really for my cause. So I, I can only be grateful and I call some of them to thank them, but a lot of them even now, I still don't know what they've done. So I would say that was quite a, a lot, a lot of that support base. You, you said that in your research, before yeah. found out that you could actually win with minimal campaigning. Mm -hmm. In reality, mm -hmm. is that what happened? No, I didn't, I, no, I didn't say I could win with minimal campaigning. Okay. What I say is that I had a fighting chance. Okay. My research showed that I had a fighting chance. That I, could okay. actually, that I was, I could actually, even with no campaigning, I still had a good chance. Okay. So then I then knew that with that, if I give it everything I got, I will guarantee so, my so chances. So the campaign was the campaign was regardless of that absolute, research. Funding. The campaign was grueling. Like, okay. And I told you, I mean, I had to do that because having been out of what you call the direct, uh, uh, should I call it, um, party structure, I mean, politicking for quite a bit and fighting with two people who have been there. And of course, they took clear opportunities. That's called the advantage of incumbency. Mm -hmm. During the reorganization, for example, they basically took advantage and went to virtually every, every region mm -hmm. uh, to be able to, in, under the guise of reorganizing, yeah. they were basically doing campaigning anyhow. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that privilege, you understand? So I clearly was coming from a very disadvantageous position. But I trusted that once I had the opportunity to start speaking heart to heart with the constituents, talking to them, I'll be able to get my message across. That was always my hope. Because the research told me that you had a good chance, but I believe that my message will make a difference. What was, what was the level of support within the Water Caucus in Parliament? I would say massive. Massive support. Okay. Massive support. Don't, don't, don't forget, it's not just the Water Caucus, it's actually Parliament. I'm coming from Parliament. Yeah. And, uh, and the only candidate out of the three who is a former MP. Okay. So naturally, if there is anyone who can understand the issues that are in Parliament, who has a certain affinity with them, who can appreciate where they are coming from and the difficulties they go through. It will be me. Okay. I have the advantage. I see Dun Kitty as a, as a was the name, general secretary, was also a former member of parliament. Yeah. And so naturally, the parliamentarians do appreciate that if you have an MP, who is a general secretary who has been a previous MP, I mean, it becomes a much more advantageous position. So I believe So I you have their complete support in, in this country? A lot, a lot of those who actually were, were, were working for me, even without knowing where the MPs, they were working, they worked super hard for me, yeah. super, super hard for me. So this is, for me, a personal curiosity. Mm -hmm. Where did you disappear to? <laughs> <laughs> it's a question I've been asked many times. Yeah. It's a question I've been asked many times. Even the truth is that I hadn't really disappeared. Uh, let's say it this way. You know, I work hard for this party as a, as a, a chief communicator for the party until we won power in 2009. Now, so when we won power in 2009, I became deputy finance minister. I made, a, I made what you call a transition into speaking only on the economy. So the real frontline politicking took a second, took backstage. I felt I needed to allow those who took over from me, as far as what you call the national propaganda secretary or national communication, to be able to do that for the party. So I focused just on talking economy. So if you notice, between 2013 to 2016, my voice was heard extensively on the economy. Mm -hmm. I basically, I did almost every debate on behalf of the Minister of Finance mm -hmm. in, on your, on your yes, platform, yes, so yes, yes. platform. So that became the first transition, purely economics and finance, because that was my job. I wanted to make sure I do that. Now, 2013, I moved now into, first I started as Minister at the presidency and for that period I was no more in charge of finance so you couldn't hear my voice on finance anymore because again I needed to be respectful to Setepe who then became the finance minister at 2000 Monacote and the rest who were deputies I couldn't now be talking about finance so I naturally went through a period where you wouldn't hear my voice on finance anymore I couldn't be talking about, about the policies because there were people at the party office who should do the same mm -hmm. I eventually moved it to a great ministry I will speak about agri for the most part. Then I move in transport ministry. I will speak about transport for the most part. In parliament, most people hear me during the budget debate because that was still an area of passion. So people heard my voice strongly on the budget debate. I was very, very much into committee work as well. But the day-to-day -day legislation was never been my passion. In fact, that's the reason why I couldn't even stay in parliament for too long mm -hmm. because my interest in parliament tended to be a bit narrow. I wanted a few things. 
I wanted, for example, the ability to leverage development for my people, which I did, in terms of what you call development infrastructure and the things that in Peace School Law before, I did that a bit. But the day-to-day -day legislation has never been a passion. So that was not something I intended to stay in Parliament for too long about. Um, so after I stayed, I, and I, I came out of Parliament for eight years, so 2021 to now, largely, largely, I've played a massive role for the party, but much more from the background. So, for example, Sami Jenfi's outfit, the communication outfit, is a group that I've actually worked very closely with, but working much more from the background, basically supporting that group, supporting the whole communication. From time to time, they were assigned me to a responsive. So you see me sometimes appear, maybe on Joy, come yeah. and do some debate or go but to the bed. Those are very minimal. Yeah. Those are minimal. Because really, even the truth is, is this, for me, I look at this more as a collective rather than an individual thing. Mm. As long as a good job is being done by the collective, I'm happy. I, I don't have a problem at all being in the background and supporting people. I never had but, fact, but why most people, most people don't know, but I actually would not even have become propaganda secretary if it were not for the personal insistence of Jerry Rollins. Okay. I'm telling you, I didn't, I didn't have an interest. I remember when we were traveling to Bulga for the youth conference, when Haruna Idrisu emerged as a, as a, as a youth uh, uh, organizer, I mean, he won again as a youth organizer. That was on that trip that Rollins managed to convince me. I kept telling them, mm -hmm, sir, I'm doing a good job for the party, I can help from the background. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem being in the background and helping the communication of the party. I never had a problem at all with that. I was helping you as well, Ronnie. So I, mean, I can continue and say, no, no, no. You need to run to become a national officer of the party. It's important. I took that decision purely for that. So I'm somebody, I don't have a problem moving into the background to help. It's, not, it's never been about that at all. And when I need to come into the forefront, you can trust that when I appear in the forefront, I'm coming to do a super job. I can do both. Yeah. So basically, I can do the two. I okay. can be on the bench and do a great job at the bench by inspiring and motivating. I can come on the field when I'm needed to do a great okay, job. Okay, so now you've answered the question, yeah. where did you disappear to? Yeah. You didn't disappear, yeah. you were the background yeah. helping yeah. Uh, the comms team. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide to take a back seat? I, I, I wouldn't call it taking a back seat. Let's, call it, let's say it this way, that uh, uh, over the period of many years, uh, a number of things have been of concern to me. A number of things have been of concern to me. Um, I've been, for example, a bit disappointed by what I call very entrenched position, which I felt were too partisan and were not in the interest of the nation. That has been a concern to me. I believe, I believe we, we need to appreciate that the reason why we have political parties is to face a form of fight to win power. But there's much more than that. It's to fight to bring empowerment to people, fight to bring transformation to our country. And to a certain extent, I think sometimes we get so enmeshed in the, what you call the raw politicking that it almost becomes as if the only reason why political parties are there is to simply just win power for the sake of winning power. And I have been concerned about that. I've been concerned that the parties, both parties, need to become much more patriotic, much more loving our nation, much more desirous of making sure that the aim of the parties is not simply about winning power, but doing what it is that can actually inure to the greatest benefit of our party. I would say over the last six years, mm. I've had issues to be very, very, very sad concerning Ghana. And it's not because ADC is a party of angels at all, but I've seen the, shall I call it, in what MPP has, has done to be a, such a massive, massive letdown. And I feel the young people are becoming increasingly alarmed and almost losing hope in the two parties because of the strain to which things have gone bad in the country. And those for me have been a massive concern. I've had that concern also when I've heard some people in the NDC express the view that, listen, some of what I call the, the plain, uh, shall I call it, the plain lack of love for nation and just pure love for partisanship should actually become the norm in the NDC. And some of us have thought that with everything we go. He said, no, we can never reduce ourselves to becoming like MPP. That's thinking primarily about itself. and it doesn't really care whether that is good for country or not. I want to build, I wanted to build a party. That is a party in alignment with our anthem. And our anthem, uh, even if you, if you listen to the NDC anthem, mm -hmm. the first line is called, Arise, Arise, for Ghana, ye patriots of the land. That tells you who we're supposed to be. A group of patriots, people who love, and I always say that, that we came out, you know, NDC was formed on 10th June 1992, MPP subsequently in August. And as at that 10th June 1992, we already had an anthem that's talking about arise, arise, ye patriot of the land. So if there's actually a party that's supposed to be a real patriotic party, that's us, and not them. And they have shown through their history that uh, they seem to care far more for themselves as a party than they do care for us as a nation. So I'm, I kept saying that 
And this must be thinking seriously about how we can, as it were, increase our level of love for our nation. How we can do whatever it is that can lift this nation and make it a better nation. And when the nation gets better, members of the NDC also get better. It's not been easy being able to convince everybody because some people see what I call the complete decadence and degeneration across the other side. And people almost start to feel as if that's how it ought to be take over power and think only about yourself. It doesn't matter about Ghana. Just build something for yourself. And some of us have been in the middle and say, no, we can't do that. The moment we do that, this nation is gone. The soul of this nation is gone. So, so I would say a lot of that contributed to some amount of quietness on my part. I became pretty concerned about what I call the fast decline in our politicking, where people were increasingly just thinking about party, 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 uh, nation, secondary, secondary, secondary. I said, no, we can do that. This is a party that was formed by patriots. No matter, I mean, they were no perfect human being, but these were people who played massive role between 1982 to 1992, and that saw a period of what you call reconstruction of our country from a verge of collapse into setting the stage for what I'll call a much more stable democracy today. Regardless of whatever imperfection they had, they showed to have a real passion. And this party, therefore, must continue to, to carry aloft that banner of patriotism, of love for nation. And so this position that some of us are in Kubri is one that clearly we are going to fight for this party to make it a party that it ought to be, but also a party that is rededicating itself to its original principles of love for country, of patriotism. Mm. I'm looking at this party becoming greater and better in terms of values, a party that cares about its members, finds ways which you can unleash opportunity and unleash creativity, but also a party that is setting the bar so that MPP will be always will look at the competition and say, you know what, let's also lift the bar and it becomes better for Ghana. Mm. I look forward for a competition that is beautiful between two parties seeking for excellence, as opposed to what we have today, which is simply a lethal battle as to who can destroy the other first. Mm. I get power and all I want to do is to totally annihilate the other party. I want to destroy the other party. I want to destroy businesses that support it. I want to persecute and even people who are innocent. I think I call it a primitive kind of politic and, mm. and we must transcend that politic. So to, is, is it fair to say that over the last six years, mm -hmm. you got to a place where you almost lost faith in, the, in, in partisan politics? Yeah, in the ways that yeah. You, you'll, be, you'll, be right. you'll be right to say that. I started really, I, for me, I would say I started really fearing for this country. Mm. I started fearing for this country. And I started feeling for especially the young people of this country. This must not continue. Well, uh, politicking is wonderful. We must do everything. It's a competitive situation. We must do everything to make our party stronger. But we should never lose sight of the fact that the ultimate aim of the party is to be a means by which we can bring greater things to our country, especially for the young generation. And that young generation, even it does not even happen to be one party. For example, there are young people today who may be holding our future. And some of those young people may be NDC. Some mm. of them may be MPP. Some of them may actually not be any political mm. party at all. Our business is to build a nation that can create opportunity for these young people to emerge in order to make our country You really decided country. to come back. Is it because you got to a place again now where you thought, well, you can't you, you can just check out? You have to create the party and the country you want. Absolutely. So Absolutely. you jump in now and see if we can make change. Is that a consideration that, that or what changed now? What changed between the last six years and maybe the last one year when you now decided to come? What 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 what, what switched? No, I think I think it's the same thing. I mean, whether I was off off or on what you call on a on a day to day level, I mean the love for nation has always been strong. The love for party has also actually always been strong because that's who I have been. I've been I've been what you call a core NDC man from nineteen ninety two. I was brand chairman of this party in nineteen ninety two. So I used to smile when I saw my contender Elvis and uh, my younger contender Otokun. I'm like, you're 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 younger guys. I've been here from nineteen ninety two. I've been right there from the beginning. In fact, I was on campus, University of Ghana campus, and because of my love for NDC, I never showed an interest in any of this student leadership. The two of them would play the convenient role of playing student leadership when it suited them, and then after that, come and don the garb of the NDC. I never did that. I told everyone in plain language right from the very first week at the University of Ghana campus that I am a core person who believes in Rollins and believes in the course of the party, and I'm not going to take any of that student leadership because that would mean I was going to work against Rollins and I was never interested. That's me. me. So mine has never been a politics of convenience. No, it's been pure conviction for me from the word, word go. Now, so I felt that as a party, there was a need for a certain uh, capacity to find our route again, 
to rededicate ourselves to those principles again. I would say that actually the departure of Ronnie's has also been a part of that. After Ronnie's eventually moved, some of us started feeling very deep that listen, we needed to find a way in which people have to imagine that leadership to see what we can do to ensure that our original principles are restored again. We find ways of restoring the original principles again. So that is they've why you came back. They've, they've always been there, but we need to find ways we can find those principles to get to a higher level for the sake of our country, for the sake of our country. Mm. I would say yes. So you okay. came back. Rawlings is no more there. Rawlings was almost the, 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 the pivot around which drags you back to probability accountability and all those values. Yeah. He, he's, he's not there anymore. Yeah. Somebody like uh, Matamidu just gave up and says, now nah, Rawlings is no more there. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't want to you know, participate. You mm -hmm. say somebody needs to step into the Rawlings role, I guess. To, to sort of pull the party back yeah, yeah, okay. to I its call. Okay. Is that what yeah, it is? Yeah. Let, uh, let me not call it Ronnie's role. Let me just say this way that we needed to find ways in which, because you know, it happens. It happens to, to groups. It happens to even really religious institutions. That there are moments where along the line you can start drifting away from some of the very core beliefs. Mm. There was a party drifting. Uh, generally, I think no, no party is perfect, as you know. No party is perfect at all because it's a party of human beings. So there could be imperfections here and there. But as a group, as an organization, you always have to have situations where there are individuals who will be able to say, you know what, these are core principles and we need to find ways in which we can rededicate ourselves to them. Yeah. I would say that I, I, I want to be one of the individuals who can help play that role uh, in order to be able to help us to reach the next level we ought to go. Because I feel we actually have levels we can go again. I don't think we have exhausted our capacity at all and we need to work towards achieving yeah. that. We're going to take another quick break. When I return, we'll wrap up, but now talk about big national issues but also the, how the party can now retain and regain uh, power in 2024, which is the ultimate. The reason why he's been elected is simply to deliver victory for the NDC in 2024. Uh, All the things he said about you know, patriotism, you know, changing the, uh, the way the party, the government is run and the, the nation won't happen if they are in opposition. So when we come back, how does he plan to work with the rest of the team to deliver that? But the name, the, the name, the face on the ballot will be um, somebody else, not his. You have to mm -hmm. help the person. Either it's John Mahama or the other individuals who are interested. Mm -hmm. uh, how will that's going to be the big next fight for the N NDC? How does he find himself in that, in the midst of all that? That will happen next year uh, towards victory in 2024, if indeed they put their act together. Stay with me. Thanks for staying with us. My guest is still the newly elected General Secretary of the NDC, Fifi Kwete. Mr. Kwete, so the party needs power mm -hmm. in 2024. Sure. You now are the helm. Mm -hmm. The party has had some you know, challenges in the mm -hmm. last few years. You, you talked about that in this interview. Sure. You have to work with the rest of your colleagues. Absolutely. Today. How do you deliver that? Uh, we, we basically just have to look at the last time uh, we took the MPP out of power. And that was actually um, the emergence of uh, a group of us out of Congress in 2005. That happened in Koforido. That was a group that saw the emergence of uh, Dr. Kobinanje as chairman of the party, uh, Honorable Johnson as the general secretary, Ama Benyuadu as women organizer, Haruna Edrisu, youth organizer, myself, communication officer, national propaganda secretary. So that, that group emerged. And that group was a group that worked very hard. In fact, I forgot, a national organizer of oh, Office oh, One Puffo was also in that group as well. And we worked super hard, work as a very close-knit unit, very committed to making sure we deliver. I believe this group, as I see it, is a group that clearly is capable of doing, if, if not more. I, I, it's, a, it's a group that I actually have a lot of confidence in. Uh, Johnson Asi Nunketi as chairman, uh, myself general secretary, uh, Sami Jemfia, national communication officer, Yabin as national organizer, uh, was the name uh, uh, Giorgio Pariado as youth organizer, uh, Hannah, Binyu, uh, Hannah, Hannah Bisu, Bisu, Hannah B Hannah Bisu as a women organizer. I mean, that's, that, 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 that's a very loaded team. Huh? I believe we can, we can as it were, give MPP a good, good, good run for the money. I ultimately believe that at the end of the day, the choice lies with the millions of Ghanaians. They make that choice. But we have to make it very difficult for them not to, reach, no, I mean, uh, not, 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 not to choose us. We have to work super hard, but not just about taking on the NPP, but also, I mean, offering a clear and very credible alternative. And I think the greatest alternative you, uh, you, you offer is not so much about uh, policies necessarily, it's also about character. Because I think this is a nation that is crying for what I call leadership of character. Because ultimately, no matter how brilliant your policies may be, when people feel you have no character, you cannot be trusted. 
you, you're not truthful. You take them for granted. You lie to them. You play games with them. Naturally, there's a loss of faith. And I think this party have to place character, character and credibility at the very center of everything we do. Mm. If we do that, I believe we will start by getting a lot more young people starting to have faith in us again. Mm. And I, I mean, I'm, I, I've always been someone who is extremely passionate about young people. So I believe as a party in terms of the leadership and whoever emerges a flag bearer, we will be making character and character and credibility. You talk the about the flag bearer. Some, so many have said within mm. your party mm -hmm. and outside the party, mm -hmm. That as far as the arrowhead is concerned, mm -hmm. John Mahama represents your most viable option. You agree? Mm -hmm. I would say that if you check the history uh, of, our, of our country pretty well, mm, it always tended to favor uh, candidates who have had a certain history. Uh, that happened with Rollins. Rollins won the first two elections automatically because uh, he had been known for, for 10 years of PRDC. And then President Kufo, having had quite a history himself in terms of working the ground, being known, emerged subsequently. Prof Mills having worked the ground himself for many years emerged subsequently. And of course, John Mahama well, came as a vice, vice uh, uh, to Prof Mills, so got the opportunity. But subsequently, Nana Kufuadu having himself worked many, many, many on the ground for so many years also had an opportunity. So off the top, I would say based on the history, you see John Mahama start clearly as a big, big, big favorite. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop anything. People said I was not favorite, but I came. So you never know. Uh, but uh, by the interest clearly. of the party, mm -hmm. you believe that will be the, the best possible choice for you? you Just not a better chance I, of winning? I feel, I feel the delegates of this party are, are brilliant people. They know what they want. And uh, the same way you can see, I mean, in spite of the very nature of the campaign that went on for this national executive position, you saw the choice of the delegate. Mm. They went actually for people that they believe 100% will be able to deliver victory. I think they will do exactly the same thing. They want to win power and they are not going to, they are not going to gamble. Mm. There's a view that one yeah. of the things you also need to do, uh, that the NPP has somehow managed to infiltrate your ranks okay. to the point where they now are able to control some of the outcomes, even within the N NDC. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something that you're concerned about or something that you believe it's exaggerated or doesn't exist? Okay. And how do you want to tackle it? Okay, you know, uh, it's always a case that uh, as you run for, 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 power, for, for, for elections, uh, your opponents also want to do whatever they can. And one of it is to see whether they can infiltrate your ranks. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've always believed in one thing that uh, those who really do the decision, those who take the ultimate decision are the masses. I mean, those who got the millions of supporters that you have. They more than anyone. So the leadership is important, but the voice and the will of the, of the, of the, of the, of the team and supporters of the party and those who are sympathizing and who want to change, for example, will be the much more important thing. Now, if there's anybody who is even, uh, what you call a mole within, that person clearly is going to be in danger. Because with the kind of leadership we have at the moment, if you are a mole, you are soon going to be in trouble you definitely are going to be in trouble. So to be honest, it's something I will not, I will not underplay. I will not, I will not think it's unimportant. But I will say that the collective will of those of us who want the right thing to be done and supported by the millions of supporters is going to make sure, even if you're an infiltrator for the MPP, uh, you're going to be What you just said that my stand shivers down the spine of moles in your party. You say you, you're going to be found out very soon because uh, of absolutely. the current crop you have. Absolutely. This, this is, absolutely. This I mean, my, my, my own belief is that with the suffering the people of Ghana are going through, I mean, with the, we, I mean, you. I don't want to go into the details of the economy, but if you see this kind of, uh, kind of, I mean, massive suffering. I mean, the kind of suffering hardship that is going through. If you can still see all that, and because of your stomach, you decide to be a mole to stop the change that is absolutely important for the millions of people. You are going to have a lot of curses on you, and that curse is not even coming from me. Even the suffering of the people alone will be the curse that you carry, and that curse can actually affect you and affect generations to come. So, if you are one of those, I think you better be thinking again. Quick fire question before we wrap up: mm -hmm. You look at the current crop that has just been elected, and it screams combatant, militant, <laughs> fearsome, <laughs> firebrand. Mm -hmm. You agree? Absolutely, I agree. I agree, but. I would say that uh, it's not just going to be militancy, it's not just going to be, be having fire, fire, fire brand, but also it's going to, I call it control aggression. Control aggression, and that's what you get. I mean, some of us are known to be absolute fire, but if you check my fire well, a fire that is very well controlled. I'm like a boxer in a ring, and I know when I'm, I'm throwing my punch, and when I have to hold back and take your punch. I know that, and I can do both very well, and I'm sure General Mosquito the same. So we'll, do, we'll make sure it infuses across. So we don't just have what I call reckless aggression, but it's aggression that is properly directed and towards achieving results. And then finally, 
you, you started by saying that you believe the, the economy will become mm. the issue around where the, the election decided. It yeah, very true. Um, of course, the economy is in a terrible place. You're having the like, biggest crisis mm. of a generation yeah. in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Does that give you a sense of comfort that 2024 is guaranteed or you are being cautious in the way you look yeah. at your chances? Yeah. Even let me tell you, I mean, my, my approach generally is always to operate on a worst case basis. And that's even what I did in this campaign. In spite of the fact that I had the research that showed that I had a good chance to win. Trust me, I think I, 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 I campaigned like, like my whole life depended on it. As if basically I was the one in the back fighting to go to the front. And that's how I believe it ought to be. Let's not take anything for granted. The fact that there's goodwill does not guarantee anything. We were that close to losing power in 2008. I mean, to not winning power in 2008 is part of the goodwill we had. We were that, that close. It was all happening in that campaign, that tells mm. you. So for some of us, uh, no, it's not just going to be an issue of saying that the economy has collapsed and therefore we are winning power. We are fighting with an opponent that is desperate. That will stop at nothing to be able to get what he want. And so therefore, when you're fighting such an opponent, you need to make sure you keep your eye on the ball and give everything you got until you cross that line. And I mean, trust me, we will do that. Well, where's the party? I would. I will soon. I will soon. I will soon inform inform you. I mean, once we to Christmas. <laughs> this is the perfect Christmas present I for know, yourself. I know. I but know. one that must be shared. I know. I know. There? there must I be know. a celebration there, somewhere. I'm consulting the key delegate, and once we agree, I mean, maybe we might have to choose one of the constituencies to go and have a celebration, yeah. or maybe we do a crowd. So I will. I will, I will let you know. I, I, I want to. I will definitely. I will invite you. Okay. I definitely invite you. Congratulations Thank again. You. And Thank Merry you. Thank you very Christmas. much. Appreciate it. The same to you and to all your many viewers. That's uh, Fifi Kwete. Always exciting talking to him. More of this. Now that he's a general secretary, finally Fifi Kwete is back uh, from, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he says he didn't go anywhere. He was in the background for many, many reasons that he's elaborated. But now we're going to have him now. It's going to be, a, you know, a, a household name again for the next four years at least that he holds this uh, position. We'll see how this pans out in 2024 as well with him as a general secretary. Enjoy the rest of your evening.